and my ancestors on my mother's line are buried with the first people of Sinaloa, Mexico, whose tribe and name we no longer have memory of. And my ancestors buried on my mother line also are from northern and southern Italy. And on my father's side, my ancestors are buried in Ireland, in Dublin, in Tipperary County by Devil's Bit Canyon. And my family name on my father's side comes from the Gaelic people whose name is Gleason. So I want to offer gratitude to my ancestors, gratitude to those who came before me. I want to offer gratitude to all beings, gratitude offering to the north, north of the winds, of the spirit of the air, of the aurora borealis, of the moose medicine, of the black bear. I want to invite and offer gratitude to east and to the beings of the east. Gratitude to the land of the rising sun. Gratitude to Fujisan and the Sakura cherry blossoms. Gratitude to the warrior spirit and the element of fire that burns and burns and like a phoenix rises over and over and over again. I want to offer gratitude to the south, to the Apus and the gods of the mountains, the Andes, to my sisters in Costa Rica and my spirit family in Peru, to the medicine people there and the first people of that land holding the energy of the anaconda that I was taught brings in Kundalini, who's working with the root chakra. I want to offer gratitude for my relations and gratitude for my spirit kin of the West, West land of water, West, the land of mystery, and may the insights from the land of the West visit us like birds in our dreams. Gratitude to the star people and sky people above, may their blessings rain upon us now. Gratitude to the earth, the below, to Pachamama, to the Aina, to Mama Gaia, where the bones of all of our ancestors are buried. And then gratitude to the seventh direction that's within, O oh, Mateo. Gratitude to the crystal core in our center, the infinite, the one, the inward, seventh direction, seventh dimension, dimensionless, timeless space. For all these things, gratitude for all my relations, all those who've come before me, and gratitude for each one of you that we could meet together in this way. So that is the um, one, there's lots of variations, but that is an introduction and calling of the directions, which is a very, very um, traditional practice. And what's amazing about calling of the directions is it's different depending on where you are. And the reason that, um, it's kind of a, it's an experiential piece. So you're hearing it, but also you can sort of experience the idea of connecting to all beings. So the title of the talk is Caring for Earth and All Beings, and that's because the elements are beings. The, the fire is kin. Um, from everything I've seen so far in Hawaiian indigeneity, it's the same. There's these these familial relations with all beings, they're not just outside of ourselves. <clears throat> um, different teachers that I've had, Osiem Chokotin, who's taught me this flute. Um, I have a grandmother, Karina, who works with me. She's from the Samai lineage, which is from Finland. I, um, grandmother, Abuela Maninali, is from Mexico. And, um, Brother Eric and many, many others. I've been very blessed to work with several elders who keep me around. <laughs> and um, so my learnings about what it means to be pe people of place, to come back into ind indigeneity and remembrance of what it means to be in relationship with all beings is woven from many different contexts and many different lineages. 
um, there's a writer named Martin Buber who wrote a book called I and Thou, and some of you might be familiar with it. And it's a really uh, great book for illustrating some concepts. He uses the term I, it, and I and thou. And when we talk about relationship, relationship with the earth, relationship to nature, relationship to different beings on the planet, from Earth Day, a lot of um, like 70s activists kind of viewed it as us and nature or us and the mother, but that the mother was like separate from ourself and like a thing that we needed to save. And um, that's what I think some might call an I-it relationship. So even though we're cherishing and honoring it, we're still seeing it as an it, not as a familial being, or as Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which I highly recommend, um, suggests non-human people. So starting to think about the rock people and the tree people and the wind people, that all of these beings around us are non-human people. And um, my brother Chokotin talks about when he goes to do activism on behalf of the environment, on behalf of the earth, he doesn't think of himself as an activist. He thinks of himself as a protector, as a guardian, um, a prayer warrior, he says. Robin Wall Kimmerer says um, this about activism. Action on behalf of life transforms because the relationship between the self and the world is reciprocal. It's not a question of first getting saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. So it's moving in out of this relationship of I and it into closer to something we might think of as called I and thou. I and thou is really about like oneness, our relationship with ourself with oneness. And what's really amazing about uh, indigenous traditions um, is you have this concept of oneness and divinity that we see, or I find easiest to access through Eastern philosophy, through yoga um, and Buddhism and different types of meditation. But what's amazing about indigenous practices of the first people is it's place specific. So they're accessing this oneness through a specific relationship. Um, and I like to use the term I and you. So it's about, it's not just that it, that beautiful thing over there that's a thing, it's I and you and my relationship with you. My relationship with trees, I'm not just saving the trees, it's my relationship with this particular tree. And um, I may or may not tell this story, I've shared once before about the tree, but from an indigenous place, there's this understanding that it's not just, it's that tree, and then it's that tree, our relationship with that particular beautiful old, old willow tree, or, or whatever it is, right, maybe an ohia tree or something that you really like, but that that tree actually speaks for all the trees. And can we can when we connect to that tree, we connect to all of the tree beings. And then also we're connecting to the tree of life at the same time. So there's these different levels of connecting to nature, not as an it, but as a relationship. Oh, so many things to share with you. Um, my Auntie Hazel says that um, it's so important to come back into relationship with place. So what does it mean to become people of place? Um, it means knowing the names of the beings around. On the landscape, these are rolling hills, and these hills are the arms of the mother that's enfolding you. And that as you walk, you're being cleansed and brushed and held um, with it as, as a you know, as an entity, as a being, um, and that you know the names of all the species of the plants and the animals and the, the trails and in the dry season and the wet season there in Hawaii or, or in other parts that have more temperate climates, 
you know the seasonality of when things rise. That's my little, my little owl. So the practical piece of coming into place that I wrote down, the practical pieces are hmm, learning how to walk with the sacred in your life, learning how to do this in relationship with the very specific place that you're in, learn the indigenous names for the beings in your place because the, the language is holding the most recent memory of how to walk in relationship with that place. Learn the history of the peoples of the place. And if you're able to find out your own ancestry and do the same for the place where your ancestors were buried. This is how we can begin to come into relationship with place. And the very last thing I wanted to leave you with, which is a loaded one, but it's also not, is as you're moving in a way, coming into relationship with place, all you have to do is remember her, which is this fun acronym that I just created. Remember her, remember Pachamama, remember the Aina, remember her stands for H and five R's, <laughs> humility, reparation, regeneration, relocalizing, reciprocity, and relationship. So just remember her, H R R R R R, <laughs> with five R's. And the very last thing, and for each one of those things, I have quotes and stories and things for you. But the very last thing, I wanted to give the last word to Grandmother Agnes Baker Pilgrim of the Tecalma people. It's a beautiful river um, in Oregon, south of me. She was the chairperson of the inter the. International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers, and such a thing exists if you don't know of it yet. The International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. And she was the most recent chairperson. She just turned 95 and she just passed um, it was last fall. And she always said that she was a salmon protector. So she always said that um, the salmon is sacred, the water is sacred and that we are all made of water and we're all just water babies and we are filled with love and loving flowing water and no matter what happens, keep on keeping on. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Can you repeat the four R's again? I. I just so I could hear them. Yes, and I was thinking I could send it out. Um, and I also have some permaculture training, so some of that snuck in there too. Um, her, so humility, reparation, regeneration, relocalizing, reciprocity, and relationship. Her, as we're becoming Rebecoming people place, just remember her. That, that hits most of the, the big ones. Mm -hmm. And I can speak to any of those um, and have quotes for them and stories. And yes, so happy and grateful to be here to share this with you as we prepare for, um, for Earth Day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Miku, would you uh, kindly tell your story of? The little cypress tree. Yes. Yes, happy to. Um, okay. So part of my training, I've been invited to different types of dances called tree of life dances. There's from different traditions, um, at least certainly on North America, Central and South America now. Um, and they all look different. But one thing that's very similar is you're dancing around a tree. And so in this tradition, you actually, you dance for two or three nights, all night long, and um, go into what's called a, a sh you know, shamanistic night. There's no substances involved. It's really you're holding hands and you're in a circle and you're chanting and you're singing um, songs in the language of the first peoples. Um, most of them are Sioux and Lakota. And so I'm, I'm, I'm there for the first time. I, it's easy to get distracted. They always say, like, look at the tree, look at the tree. And so I'm there, I'm looking at a tree. Now, my dance is held in the wintertime. So everyone else dances around these giant trees outside. 
But our dance, we had to be indoors because it was freezing cold. It was February in Washington. There's all this snow. So they, they bring in a very small potted cedar tree. And so here we are. This is a really powerful dance. They've done I mean, smudging and smoking pipes and all of these things to prepare. And there's this tiny little tree in the middle. And even this tree had like a slightly yellowy top. And so we're dancing and they're like, look at the tree, look at the tree. And in my kind of ignorance and probably arrogance or whatever, I don't know, I... I, th I thought to myself, what, what does this little tree have to, you know, what does this small tree have to teach me? It's like three years old or something. And the tree spoke back. And the, the insight or the way it communicated was sort of like an image. And it said, it showed, it, like, <laughs> it showed me that it's not just this small tree. It zoomed out and became all cedar trees all the trees in the world and then it, and then it brought me into the universe and i was floating with like the tree of life and then back into this tiny little tree and then and then i kind of came came to if that makes sense and i was like oh <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> my bad <laughs> i get it <laughs> yeah is there a sense um, when you talk about the um, specific a location, the one spirit, and then terms in terms of location? Is there a sense that when kind of bringing the one into a particular of the many, so to speak? that there's a kind of consecration that's taking place, uh, something that in a sense helps to bring together, to unify the, the, the global and the local in, this, in a mystical sense? That's a really good question. And I think, um, if you look at people who live with the land, who live live this life as a, as a they're moving and breathing and walking with the sacred with the divine i would think i would say they here's a double negative they never don't see it as the oneness okay when when and uh, this would be when we're living in right relationship in balance in a wildness where indigeneity is still present. It's totally shifted when we're in our kind of colonized modern world, but people that are really still living that way, there's no difference. It, it reminds me, if I might, it reminds me instantly, uh, I came to mind that in Krishna, in the Bhagavad Gita, where he's saying, whatever you do, in a sense, uh, offer it, make it an offering to me, quote, quote, um, that, such that you realize, even if you don't do it mechanically, because that's not necessarily a help, good thing, but when one is remembers it or calls it to mind, there's something about that that, that makes the particular uh, uh, sacred. And that act also teaches you something. That's what I loved about what you were saying. You, you get to, you see the you see the transcendent and the imminent. You see it in the local. The local becomes much more, much more meaningful, interesting, engaging to be discovered to me. In what you were saying, it's not like you're lost in some abstract transcendental. You're actually making it living, vital, knowledgeable. It's just very quite, quite a wonderful thing. And I saw the parallel with Hinduism. Yeah. I I think that's a perfect example. In the Bhagavad Gita, I think there's a moment where well, where God basically shows the thousand faces. And that's like, that's, that's kind of what it is, except mm -hmm. in reverse. They're living from the space where there's a knowingness that each of these, each leaf, each blade of grass um, is, represent, is that. It's not even representing it. It, it, it is that. Mm -hmm. And it's much harder to do in a modern day context in yeah. cement and pavement and traffic and um, all that. But you know, 
I was just chatting with my really close friend, um, Shalini, and, and she's from India, and I went there for her wedding, and we were talking about how people there, at least where she lives, there's this, if anyone here has ever been to India, there's this, this constant traffic noise, honk, 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 like there's like never not honking. And still, there's this, they're meditating, they're coming to stillness, no matter, regardless of like what's going on around, like there's, if you're practiced in it or raised in it, you can still walk and um, still hold that space. Yeah. If I might mention one thing relevant to what you just said, as an experience myself, uh, when I first landed in India, I was in Bombay. Um, and I was being taken through the city of Bombay by a, a friend, by an elderly gentleman. Uh, and it was, Bombay was like, whoa, what was, it was just incredible numbers of people, all kinds of transportation you can possibly imagine. It looked in a sense like chaos. And I was going, this is just overwhelming. And he said, no, now Jim, look over there, you see the cow, see the, the bulls. And I looked over there in the center, uh, near the, the center of where we were, and there were these, the Brahmin bulls, they were just, they were just standing there quietly, serenely, not moving. And he said, they center us. <clears throat> and furthermore, they're reflecting what people in Bombay inwardly feel. They're not caught in your sense of chaos. They're, they're, quite, they're going about it quite calmly. <laughs> and they have a sense of, a sense of tranquility that belies what you see as the outer chaos. There's somewhere there's a wonderful order to everything and no one gets hurt. <laughs> and I said, wonderful, that was a good experience for me, a good lesson for me. And recall, you can be tranquil. Even in the midst of cacophony, there can be a symphony, I suppose. Yes. I, I wanted to ask um, Mary, who's um, quite a bit more um, knowledgeable in the Bible than I have ever been and uh, would like to be. Um, isn't there something like turn a stone and I am there that Christ says? That I don't know enough about the Bible either. I am still a student and um, that, that might, I'd have to look that up. I honestly had not heard that. So I'll have to check it out and get back to you. <laughs> but does that sound like something he might have said? Um, possibly. I, like I said, I, I, I'm still a student. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> William, William Blake says that in one of his poems, but I do think it's taken from some biblical reference. I'll check it out. <laughs> I think that what can happen, or what has happened actually, with um, spirituality, religion, that is able to be more universal, is we sometimes lose the local. And so there's not the same appreciation for that particular rock. And that is what the first people, they still teach us. That's, that's what their way of being is. It's, yes, we can go into the infinite, into the oneness, and care about this small rock in front of us. And, you know? Um, and Here's then, I'll oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. There's an interesting, maybe it's a correlation. You mentioned braiding sweetgrass, where Robin Kimmerer talks about in indigenous language, in her language, uh, Potawatomi, she, um, that there are many, many more verbs than nouns. And I was thinking about that in relationship to becoming, that it's a way of thinking. Yes. I hadn't, even, I hadn't even made that connection. It's the constant act. It's in it's it's alive, right? It's she gives the example. Perhaps you remember. I'm, I may not be remembering it really well, but she gives the example of a bay, 
which is a, a body of water, an inlet, kind of the, like the San Francisco Bay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she says we're used to thinking of it as a noun. It's a bay. But that it, she puts it in such a beautiful way that you understand that it's a verb because it's constantly moving, constantly changing. Um, yet it maintains some inner deep integrity, uh, perhaps sense of place or sense of self, or there's a relationship between those two aspects of itself. I think that she she speaks to language a little bit and well a lot right a lot yeah, yeah. and um it and i think it also um sh the idea is it's not a thing nouns are like things it's but they're what they are are actually living beings that mm -hmm. yes like you said are constantly moving um what would it be like to think of ourselves that way too yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Miku, what you were saying about the I and thou, or the I and you, kind of brought into my thoughts. Actually, it kind of stirred up a, a book I had read by Ken Wilbur, uh, The One, Two, Three of God. And what I took away from his writing was, you know, in terms of relationship, you know, the third person relationship is sort of what science tries to do. It detaches, um, it's an impersonal uh, evaluation on data and analysis of the world around us. The second person is kind of like, you know, Moses when he went up to the mountain. I mean, he had a conversation with God. The first person perspective is the recognition of God is me. That God is the stone that I turn over. God is uh, the continuum of all in this existence. And if you extrapolate that further, the zero perspective would probably be the threshold into other dimensions because your perspective in relationship then is just so different. But from the human perspective, we have to categorize to understand. So he presents, you know, that three, two, one process and uh, how we look at things in different concepts and different perspectives in relationship. That's a that's a one I've read. I've read some of Ken Wilber's work. I haven't read that one. That's a beautiful um, parallel. I think um, um, Auntie Hazel is a one of my teachers and she's been the most influential she actually gave me this term relocalizing and she her that this is her specifically her thing of becoming people of place <laughs> um i think she would and she's got um plain clothes quaker backgrounds for some of her upbringing which is different if you're not familiar with it it's its, its own unique um traditions but um I think that part of what it is would actually be that second perspective. She teaches people to talk back. So when, when I'm out in the woods with her and crow flies overhead, we don't just think, oh, there's a bird flying overhead. We think like, oh, we are being blessed. L how lucky we are that, that crow has chosen to fly over in this moment. There's a, it's like a re, understanding of synchronicities and and then we talk back and then we actually say she, and she's she does it so matter-of-factly too like hello bro <laughs> so good to see you <laughs> hope you're having a good day like like this, this kind of thing <laughs> it doesn't feel flowery or like oh like it's very like hi crow <laughs> like it's very <laughs> matter of fact but the, that's is that kind of, yeah that sounds like the second the second perspective of what you we're talking about yeah much of i think what we uh perceive is kind of in that second person it is our witness to a conversation with another entity uh it's so hard to remember 
uh, or even have the concept of the first person identity of, you know, there is no me, there is no I, it is just we uh, as a collective. I think that, I think that's sort of the, at least for me, that's the goal as I'm learning this more and more, trying to embody it more and more is how do we do this, the, the both and of that, and walk with the space of knowing and not get dizzy and fall over, right? Like, you know, you have this like ringer. <laughs> There's a lot of dimensions going on here. So mm -hmm. how do you walk with sacred, with reverence and honoring and humility and keep humor and playfulness <laughs> and how silly we are as these human animals walking around on, on earth uh, as, as the crow and eagles watch us being like, what are they doing, you know? Um, <laughs> and how do we uh, hold, hold both of those pieces um, as we move and not get dizzy? <laughs> I have a question for you. What would you say to a butcher that wanted to uh, incorporate something of what you're saying into their daily work life? Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I think there's no problem with that at all. That's totally compatible. Um, it's the same way. Um, now I'm not a hunter, but I, I did grow up fishing. I grew up fish. I grew up in Alaska, and I grew up fishing salmon in Alaska. Um, and I wasn't. Um, my dad wasn't as bad as some, but I definitely wasn't raised with this tradition. But I, I do know about this hunting spirit, and there's this thing that, and a butcher is a bit different, right? Like, and it depends what kind. Like, how are they able to bring sacredness into their work? No. This is a really challenging question, but it's possible. It okay. The, I've thought of this a bit. Um, if anyone's familiar with like bushido samurai tradition in Japan, this is the closest I analogy that I have that makes sense to me. On the battlefield, they say each other's names, and they look each other in the eyes. And there's this sense of, especially if they're like arch nemeses, there's this sense of when they kill each other of honor and cherishing. And there's even a ro like romanticizing of as the knives slice through each other's bodies that they hold in, in almost an embrace. And even in art that's sometimes like portrayed almost like the relationship with a lover. So it's like, if you're going to take a life, like as a butcher would, this would be a tremendous amount of work, but it is possible to look into the eyes of the infinite and then also into the eyes of this being from the second perspective and see, look with eyes of love and take the life that way. Um, there's all sorts of emotions we have to deal with, like terror and the cow experiencing terror and things like that. So that's more complicated, but I think it is, it's possible. And um, first people that hunt, it's not unlike that. Um, interesting, yeah. Farming yeah. and, you know, butcher things a little different because it's, it's what people might say more out of balance rather than hunting, but yeah. Your answer reminds me of the story of the, the Buddha and his disciples when they went through a village and at the end of the day, he asked them, each of them, a kind of test. Were you aware of the people in the village? And of the people in the village that you saw and you were privileged to receive food from, who did you think was the most remarkable that taught us more about the, the Buddha life? And various people said various things. And the Buddha said, all of which is wonderful. You've mentioned different things, but the most remarkable was the butcher. And the butcher, they were kind of stunned. And he said, because he was a very inwardly compassionate man. And he was doing his dharma, his duty. But the way he did it, as you were just, just alluding to, which is, I thought that's why I saw the parallel. The way he did it uh, was so different than most butchers. It tells you something about the quality of the character and what the 
animals were privileged to receive. So it was, it was something very benign in what he was doing. And so that taught them not to get caught in images, mm -hmm. images of people, images of goodness, uh, and to see depth of character and more than we normally see. And I think that's a really good, that's a really important question or important idea to look at because in order to live, we need to take life. Now, taking the life of a cow is complicated, especially if you're vegetarian. But especially when you come into relationship with plant beings yeah. and you start talking to trees and, and even rocks, right? Like they're not benign. They're, they're, they're not just rocks. What is, well, I mean, you, you all know that more than I do living on, on the island with mountains, but right, these are beings and, and we do, there's some level of constructive destruction that we need to partake in to live. So we have to find a way to do, to turn towards it and do it in a way that's most honoring as best we can. Mm -hmm. And not just and 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 not and and that is us being physical beings on this place with other creatures, right? And not just going to the oneness with as a, as an escape. Yes, 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 yes. I like that's a very good point. Very good point. Not an escape, but something that aids mm -hmm. living in the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that was a good question. <laughs> do you know the the um, tradition of in uh, in northern indigenous um, areas of the idea of I think it's sedna. It's called it's the great meat dish. <laughs> do you do you know that story or that character? No, tell me. No. Tell us. Oh, okay. Hear this. It's it's a it's the, the concept of kind of a collective being that's a protector of all uh, say all life in the ocean, all life in the water. And she's her responsibility is to release animals for food, but only if there it's if people deserve it. So the ability to uh, have a, a fish for food is reliant on a kind of collective um, gratitude. Anyhow, I hoped you knew more about it than I do. I, I just was taken by the name, the great meat dish. And apparently there's a similar protective kind of collective being for um, land animals as well. <laughs> There's, so I don't, I'm not familiar with the term Sedna, but there's um, a concept called the keepers of the game. Yeah, that, that would probably, that's the sounds familiar land mammal side and of it, I think. Yeah. The, this is something I also learned from Hazel, which is that they're, um, oh, if anyone's seen Princess Mononoke, I don't remember if I brought this up. I don't think I brought this up. <laughs> um, there are these, um, each animal has its like, God form these giant versions of themselves and these beings are called the keepers of the game they're like the the animal spirit being that watches over each of those particular uh, animals and um, this is an interesting idea and I, I only I know it just through actually not not very in depth but but I have um, have the experience of seeing one and that's an interesting story so i was <laughs> yeah, out, imagine. so i was i was out on um so auntie hazel lives in southern oregon in the mountains in an, in an off-grid cabin it's a nine hour drive for me to get out there and um you know no cell phone no no reception no nothing and um i uh i sleep in this um camper van that i bring out there and in the mornings, I open up the doors and I'm just lying, like lying in the bed, looking out of this beautiful field. And there's always different bird friends that come visit and I'm starting to get to know the language and like listening for the patterns. Mm -hmm. And um, 
one day I open up my van, I'm really sleepy, and I kind of look out, and across the field are these like giant, they're, they look like deer, but they have huge ears. And I'd like, there's two of them. I like don't know what I'm looking at. Um, and then they kind of, and then they look at, they both look at me. <laughs> And then they hop away. I'm like, what? What was that? Am I dreaming? And come to find out, Hazel has only seen them twice in the like 30 years she's ever been there. They, she says that they are the keepers of the game for the hair. Mm -hmm. These are giant hair. And by giant, I mean um, like the size of deer, but they're rabbits, but they're not rabbits. You know, they have giant, they have bunny feet and bunny legs and giant ears, but they're the size of deer, like a full grown person. Like they'll look at you eye to eye. Mm. And she said that was a blessing. She said that was some sort of like a rite of passage or initiation that I got to see them. Um, so I believe that they exist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know what to do with that information, or I still kind of in disbelief. Yeah. Now, do you have similar things to tell, maybe from Hawaiian tradition? Earlier, um, when Miku was talking about talking to animals, like in a very matter of fact way, like, hey, crow, what's up? Um, I had an experience like that one time with a seal when I was in the ocean, actually in Santa Barbara. And um, I was with another person who I didn't know really well. And um, after I had this little encounter where the seal just popped up like three feet in front of me and I said hello to it and then it went away. I was like, hey, did you see that? <laughs> and the person I was with was like, you said hello to it <laughs> and I was like well yeah like what else would you do it just seemed like the thing to do it's very natural to, to do that <laughs> um and I, I think that the reason that I feel that way is because I grew up in Hawaii I, I think that that's an effect of the sort of mix of cultures but predominantly the native Hawaiian culture and um, probably also some like Japanese Buddhist tradition that's very strong in my upbringing. There's a story that Donna's um, husband, uh, Robert, tells about surfing in Santa Barbara. I think it was at an El Capitan beach and he was out there kind of by himself, I think, and a giant whale came up right next to him and kind of rolled his head over and stared with his giant eye into Bob's eye. And it just, just, it just was just the most amazing experience looking that close into the eye of a being like a whale. And I've been noticing recently going around uh, with all these masks on all the time that it's, it's kind of like covers up a lot of your face, but it leaves the eyes and I'm noticing that people, to me and to others, are using that opportunity more to really make deeper eye contact. When Renee and I went to India, we had the, had the experience of such a different culture in terms of the, everyone that I encountered really wanting to make deep, deep eye contact. Whereas in our bustly world, Western world here, not so much, even say, even though it's so bustly in India, the cows are moving all tranquilly and the people know how to move fast and yet still make that deep, that deep contact. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to someone speak from India the other day who said that maybe this virus thing is like a portal that we're gonna go through possibly and I noticed when Renee and I came back from India that at first I wasn't relating as well to everyone in, in my world over here because as we spent time in India, it seemed like we were relating through the eyes and deeper from our heart. 
from a, from your your you're experiencing or relating to other people from a different center of consciousness, more related to the heart center. And so when you came back, I came back and felt like everybody was commu trying to communicate with me shoulders up, where I was used to communicating for these three weeks in India from, from more of this, this center of, of my being, which is more like the heart. So I was wondering if you could say something about the idea of finding place and finding center, and if by doing so we can go through this portal into a new world, take an opportunity with this virus and make a better world. I've had many of the indigenous people that I've, like elders and different healers, do talk about this as being a or a, um, an opening. Oh, so yes. So this is um, what you're just suggesting is something I've been hearing over and over again by different elders. But the other thing that they say over and over again is come back into relationship with nature. Just simple, simple things like learn how to grow your own food. See if you can go to farmer's markets. The, the advice is so simple. And um, Hazel says that if you don't grow up that way, if you grow up in a modernized colonized world that people are walking around as she puts it without a full deck of cards we did not get the neuron like the maps in our brains from childhood for how to move in the world in a certain way maybe what you're describing in india and other places where people are having this experience where you're co you're connecting as humans it's because they grew up in a culture, in a foundation that gave them that ability. The advice is simple. It's so simple. It's really notice the trees around you. Learn the language of the first people around you, really. There's, there's keys in there. It changes your entire consciousness. Go for walks on the land and learn the landscape as a regular practice and let that open up your whole being is not just your heart so that you're communicating from a space of cherishing and honoring your whole self as an infinite being as god goddess and also as the sweet beautiful human animal that you are and that you can relate to each other in that way of honoring that sweetness in each other as you would honor also all non non-human people and non-human beings I would love to hear from Sharon or Diana or Laurel or Maurice. I guess I was really struck with the sacredness into our work and into our daily living as a verb. And, and I think that we talk about living enlightenment and not being enlightened. And, and I think there's something around the, also about people using oneness as a way to escape and not really relate as uh, as a oneness and, and use that as a reason to not engage. And, and I think that those things that you're saying of walking in nature and um, not using it as an escape and seeing the sacredness in everything and really touching into the ground, um, that's really important because you, you said something about the local becomes transcendent and eminent. And I think that's really important because I think that makes it, um, it's both. And it's um, feeling the experience of that sacredness in everything we do, whether it's the, the handle on the door, door that we open or um, turning on the water or being out in nature. How do we make everything that we do um, a, a prayer or a gift of sacredness? That's what struck me. Thank you for your talk. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Miku, I'd be curious to hear your your definition of the five or six words that you gave us for her. I think I'll have to type them up and send them to Renee. I think that will be an easy way. Because I literally, I pulled out quotes for them. It's like, um, so, so let's table that. Just remember her. And then we'll send it to you. Because somewhere I just realized um, I'd like to close with a song a song that helps convey this idea of how to walk with the sacred in the world. And it connects you to something called, we call it, it's hoop time. Um, and th this is uni like universal. 
where everything, where one thing ends, another thing begins. And wherever there's a beginning, there's always an end. And in indigenous practices, there's always a circle. There's the four directions and the circle. And it's because when we take one step outside of our door, we're walking back towards our home again. It's a circle. And so this is a song called Each Step Out is a Step Home. It's a, a Sioux song. And the, the, the three wisdoms they teach are come bearing gifts. And these wisdoms were taught to me when I learned traditional lay, lay making. So it's being taught still. In Hawaii, it's just slightly different. Come bearing gifts, um, carry your own weight, and give everything its life, which is reciprocity. So it goes like this. Each step out is a step home. Each step out is a step home. Come bearing gifts, carry your own way. <coughs> Give everything its life. Each step out is a step home. Each step out is a step home. Come bearing gifts, carry your own weight. Give everything its life. Each step out is a step home. Each step out is a step home. Each step out is a step home. Mm. Mahalo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Miku. That was very rich and um, Thank you. just, I, I think, a, a blessing to all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I'll send you out information all about her. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.